All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for another great and glorious day that you give us. We thank you for the, the time of the year that we set aside to, to think on your birth and to even celebrate you coming to this earth, God. But most of all, for us to have that understanding of why you came here, for you to come and go to that cross for us and be rose from the dead so that we may have life eternal with you. And we thank you for those things, Father. We thank you for your love for us, that you loved us so much that you did send your Son to this earth for the redemption of each and every one of us, God. And we just thank you so much for those things. And again, I just pray this day that you'll just be in our midst, be in our presence, and show us what we need to see and hear and understand. Open up our spiritual eyes and our minds and our ears that we can understand and see more depth of who you truly are and what you stand for. And again, I pray that you just hide me behind that precious cross that the words I speak are of you and you alone and not of man in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. We was in Luke chapter 1 last week. Uh, we're going to do it just a little bit different. What I want to do today is... Um, Kind of paint a picture maybe within your mind. And when you're in your thinking, you know, we hear so many different things, especially this time of the year, you know, about the birth of Jesus, um, the manger, the stable, and different things. And, uh, you know, as, as we read, you know, it seems like sometimes in the Scripture, it seems like, you know, you've been, you've been reading the Scriptures, and it seems like something may be missing. You know, something just don't quite add up. And we do know that the Bible, one, it does not give a blow-by-blow blow account of every minute, every second, every step, thought, word, and everything in there. So, and that's where just studying and learning comes along. And, you know, last week we talked about the, the virgin, you know, how, how Mary, you know, was a virgin, you know, and she was. And that's what Scripture tells us. And even to the, uh, to the point of trying to have an understanding about the blood of Jesus. You know, how man's blood could not be mingled with Jesus in that process. It, it just couldn't because man is a sinner. You know, so the sinful blood of man could not be mingled with him, and that was one of the purposes for the virgin birth because of man and the way the man sinned, you know, that we all sin. And it kind of gets you to thinking, you know, well, and, and like I shared last week, you know, even myself, I began to think, you know, well, even though man was a sinner and still is, well, then what makes Mary so special? You know, what makes her so special? She was, she's a human. She's a person. She messes up just like anybody else. So why would her blood, you know, even though, you know, she was carrying the child, it makes you wonder these things. And remember I shared with you in the medical field, through really doing some digging and hard looking with the umbilical cord of a baby and a woman, the blood does not mingle. It does not mix at all. And I couldn't believe it. I just, I just went into awe when I seen this. You know, because it just, I, I don't know the medical term and all this type of stuff, but the blood of a woman and the baby does not mingle. It doesn't. And it just uh, blew my mind how, how God made all this happen. How, how he created everything from the beginning to, to come out like this. And it just, it just really just it, just, it just makes you in awe of God, you know, of what he did. And even in, the, in, the, in this part, what we're going to read here, Jesus is already born in this section. So what we're going to do, we're going to start in verse 6. It just shows verse 6, but we're going to start there, but we're going to go on down many more verses. But we're going to kind of break it down and look at some different things. So starting in verse 6, it says this, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, we hear this each and every Christmas. The same verse. You know, and naturally we know what the swaddling clothes was. They, you take a baby and you wrap him up real tight. They still do it today. And that's basically what that means. And it says they laid him in a manger. Each and every one of us know that it's a feeding trough. That's what it is. He, he was in a feeding trough. And then it goes on and said there was no room for them in the inn. Now, this is the part where it really gets me to thinking. 
was there a big Hilton there? Was there a Holiday Inn Express? You know, it really makes you think. And it says, you know, there was no room in the inn. This was 2,000 years ago, guys. Come on. You know, a hotel. Do you really think that they honestly went to a hotel? And don't think I'm trying to take anything away from the Bible. I'm not. But I want to show you something about this word in. I-N-N. Okay? So, again, we, we want to kind of learn something. And I learned a lot in this time. So let's back up to verse 1 in the same chapter. In verse 1 it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, and all the world should be taxed. Okay? All the world. And in verse 2 it says, And this taxing was first made by Serenus, was governor, when Serenus was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Okay? And Joseph also went up into Galilee, from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. Okay? So, naturally, Joseph, he packed up, he went to this place. He went to the city where he was from, okay? Kind of like I said, I want to paint a picture in your mind. This is where he was from. So if this is where he was from, then that means he had family there, okay? It does. It means he had family there. So if, if this is where, you know, you were from, it's just like any, anybody in here. You say, well, I'm going home to where I was from, then that means you have family there. You have relatives, cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, all these different things, nephews. So there's people there that he knew, okay? And if you go and you really do some, some looking in the history of different things, you'll find out that he, he went there. So with him being there, then usually what people would do during this particular time in history, they would go to a family member. Okay, and stay there because, you know, they didn't have anywhere to go. Now, this word in, okay, this word in, I-N-N, sure, it does mean a place of, of lodging, okay? That's what it means. It, it is. It's a place of lodging. It also means a guest chamber or a eating room or even a spare room that is in the upper floor of someone's home, okay? Now, You've heard me talk about going to the Dominican Republic several times. Well, even in that country, okay, even in that particular country, and this is no joke, when they built a house, they would start on the ground, and they would leave rebar sticking up through the concrete blocks so that they could add to it. This was their property. This was their house. And as they got money, they would build on. There would be a set of stairs going up there. They would rent this section out or it would be a guest room for family or friends or whoever needed a place to go. And that's, that, it reminded me of that. And the reason, <clears throat> and another reason for this, you remember whenever Jesus went and had the Passover, okay? When Jesus went to have the very last supper with the disciples and they were about to partake of the Passover, Jesus told them in uh, Luke 22 and 11, it says, and you shall say unto the goodman of the house, okay, of the house, the master said unto thee, where is the guest chamber? Where's the guest chamber? Where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. So see, it was an extra room that these people had that Jesus went to and was just going to kind of rent the room, okay? And it's the, basically the same thing of what happened to Mary and Joseph. Now, granted, whenever the Good Samaritan, remember the part of the Good Samaritan, whenever he found the man that was all beat up, he went to an inn. So it basically was a place where they did actually, you know, rent out rooms or give rooms out for people to lodge. And this could be basically the same thing. I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just giving you something to think about. So it could be the fact that they went to a place and, there, and nobody had a place because there were so many people there during the tax time. So if, if it was a case, just say they went to a family member's house and all these other guests had already made it there and they had no room. There, there was no room. There was no guest chamber. There was no place for them. So, you know, naturally they, 
it is said that what they would do, the people who owned the houses during this particular time, they would even in the back of their house, they would have like a stall or a stable already set up, built onto their house or to the side of the house that they would let people stay in. And this very well ended up being the case for Mary and Joseph. But you know, there's another part. The wise men. You remember all these little things that you see, these little things of where, you know, I think, yeah, here's one of them right here. You know, they have all these little things, and they show all these people around and even the wise men standing at the stable. Did you know that was not true? Did you know it's not true? They didn't go to the stable. Matthew 2 and 11, it says, And when they were come into the house, the wise men, when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. So the wise men didn't go to a stable. They went to a house. So it could be at that particular time that whenever Jesus was born, they said that nobody knows how long it was from the time his birth was to the time that they got there. Some say nine months, some say three or four years. So irregardless of the fact, after he was born, he went into a house somewhere. Whether it was a relative, maybe they bought a house. I don't know. But it says they came into the house. So the, they were part of a house somewhere. So in this same fact, you know, he naturally he was in some form of a stall or stable because he ended up in a feeding trough whenever he was born. But this is just to kind of give you a little historical thing about, you know, what could have happened. You know, we don't know a blow-by-blow blow account of what actually happened. So this is just something to think about. So we're going to get on to the main part of what I was going to talk about. So this is kind of give you something to think about. So looking at verse 8 in Luke, Luke 2, verse 8. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So it begins talking about shepherds. A shepherd, you know, was a herdsman. That's what it was. He was a herdsman. And it also said that a shepherd was also one that cared a lot. Okay? They had a, just a great heart, not so much for their animals, but it was also for family and people around them. They cared, you know, because they took care of sheep. And, you know, they took care of their flock and all these different things. But did you know that during this particular time in history, shepherds were one of the most hated people in that time, they hated shepherds. The Egyptians, the Romans, anybody that was a shepherd was the lowest thing on the totem pole. I mean, they were they were hated because they would go out. The the they they would go out and a sheep would go in and they would just start eating up the fields and everything that the that the farmers would make. If you even look in, 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 in past history, just even during cowboy times, okay, let's, let me use that phrase. Everybody knows that one. They were hated then. You know, anybody that dealt with sheep, they just, they just did not like them. They didn't, they didn't like dealing with them. They didn't like fooling with them or anything because of, they would just let them roam around and eat up all their crops and fields and all this type of stuff, and they were hated. And if you look through, the, through history of the Old Testament, Many, many of your great patriarchs in the Old Testament were shepherds. They were. Abraham was. Look at King David, the king, the king of Jerusalem from the, you know, the lineage of David, the great king. Who was he? He was a shepherd. Remember all the little tales where it says he killed a lion and a bear? And he was a shepherd. What did he do? He ended up being a king. But still, people just hated shepherds. They just did not like anything about them. Did you know that the first, the, the first, do you know the first shepherd that was ever actually killed? The first shepherd that was ever actually killed in the Bible. He was killed. He was literally slaughtered. Genesis 4 and 2, it says, Then she bore again, talking about Eve. This time his brother Abel, now, his, now Abel was a keeper of sheep. And Cain was a tiller of the ground. Farmers hated shepherds from that time all the way forward. They did. They just despised them. They didn't like anything about them. So it kind of makes you wonder, 
you know, about things. Even the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus himself called himself a shepherd. In John 10 and 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd. Did not people hate Jesus? Many people hated Jesus. And he goes on, said the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Hebrews 13 and 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Jesus was a shepherd also, and he was. What did he do? He loved, he cared about every one of us. Even in 1 Peter 5 and 4, and it says, And when the chief shepherd... See, he was called a great shepherd. He was called a chief, chief shepherd. Even himself said, it said he was a shepherd. So when the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So he was even a great and a chief shepherd. He was a shepherd. Even in Isaiah 53 and 3, it says he is despised and rejected by men. So even people rejected the most great shepherd that there ever was the one that was born, the one that we're talking about today. After he was born, people didn't even know it, but he was going to be such a great shepherd and even be despised and hated. The shepherds were hated also. All shepherds were hated. Even today, even today, people reject shepherds. Even people today re re reject the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. You know, even today, because even in John 3 and 19, it says this, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. Even think about his birth, whether it be the 25th of December or whether it's in April, whenever he was born. It says the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. The light of the world did come into the world and men today still reject him and hate him. It says, because their deeds were evil, for everyone practices evil hates the light. Anyone that practices evil hates the light. So it kind of makes me personally think about things. The things that we do. The things that, you know, even maybe even the, that we even think. And it says, and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, and that they have been done in God. So it kind of makes you think about shepherds being hated and even the main chief shepherd. But the verse goes on in, in Luke. It says they were keeping watch over their flock by night. Kind of makes you wonder, why was they doing it at night? You know, why were they doing it at nighttime? It says they were keeping watch over their flock by night. So it kind of makes you wonder, and I'm going to throw this in there just to give you something to kind of think about. If it was nighttime over in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and, and they were there and they were watching their flocks, okay? It says they, so they were a, many of them, a few of them, or several, however, however how many they were. And it says they were watching their flocks by night, then it wouldn't be cold. It wouldn't be cold. In the wintertime over there, to my understanding, when it gets cold, and I can, I can kind of not relate to this, but I can share something with you. My daddy told me, because he worked in Kuwait for several years, he worked over there, and I remember him saying that, you know, the, <coughs> the Arabian people would come through, and they would set up these massive tents. And this was like in 80, I think, 80, 81, something like that. Anyway, they would set up these tents, and they would even have sheep and, and animals and that type of stuff. And if they seen nightfall coming or bad weather coming, they would take them all in the tent along with their Mercedes. Everything went in the tent. So it kind of makes you wonder. So if, if they were watching their flocks at night, then it had to be warm weather. Okay? And I'm going to show you this, too. I'll show you this. In the book of Ezra, Okay, in the book of Ezra, in chapter 10, in verse 9, it says this. And so all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. And this is Old Testament now, you understand. It was the ninth month of the 20th of the month, and all the people sat in the open square of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of heavy rain. 
They were trembling because it was cold. If you look and read back, you'll find out that it was cold and it was raining. Okay, so that's why they were trembling, and it was in the ninth month. Also in Jeremiah 36 and 22, it says, Now the king was sitting in the winter house, the winter house, in the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. So see, in these two particular verses, it's talking about the ninth month, and they were cold, because one said they built a fire. Okay, because it was cold. The other one says they were trembling and it was heavy rain. This ninth month in the Hebrew is called Cheslev. I think I pronounced it right. I hope I did. This month falls in between the middle of November and December. You can look it up. It's, it's, it, you can look it up. On the Hebrew calendar, that's what it is. But these guys, it said that they were watching their flocks by night. So if it was cold, they would have had their flocks put up somewhere in type of a pen or some form of protection, maybe in a tent or a cave or something like that. So it, it kind of lets you know that they were, you know, it, it wasn't cold. It wasn't cold. And plus another thing, now if you go back and you look, it said that they had a tax. So Joseph and Mary had to go back to this particular town because that's where he was from. That's where he had to go to be taxed. During this particular time in history, they would not do such a thing in the winter because everybody had to walk. And you wouldn't go walk in the cold. You wouldn't go walk in the miserable, miserable part of the winter time. Even the tax people, they had to go outside and meet people and they would not do it. Even the king himself, they would not go outside. The, the, the one who initiated the tax, they wouldn't go outside because where, what would they be doing? They would be inside by a fire warming. They, wouldn't do, they didn't do all this stuff in the wintertime. They'd done it in the spring or the summer when people could easily get out and travel because they had to walk. Now, in, in this particular time, understand, it is, un, it, is, it is said that a man can walk basically 20 miles in one day. And that's basically all he could travel. So you figure, look how far Mary and Joseph had said they'd done this for a couple of days in their travel and other people, how they had to travel these distances to get to these taxes. So it kind of gives you some thought. Just something to think about. Just want you to think about it. So it kind of paints a little bit of a picture of what's going on. And even in that particular verse, and, and in Luke again, chapter 2, it says, The glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, in, in a commentary named the Pulpit Commentary, I want you to kind of picture this in your mind. You know, here, here they were out in the field. They were feeding their flock. And, and all of a sudden, there's this glory of God just shone around them. In the pulpit commentary, it says this, the white shining cloud of intolerable brightness. Think about it. The intolerable brightness known among the Jews as Shekinah. You've heard that word, Shekinah, which Shekinah glory, which it means dwelling or settling. So his glory came and dwelled or even settled around these guys. Possibly some women there, I don't know. And it says they settled, and it denotes the dwelling or settling of a divine presence of God. Can you imagine being out in a field, you're sitting there with your buddies, watching your sheep, maybe had a little fire just for light or, or whatever, and all of a sudden this massive bright light just shone all around. I mean, just shone all around. And, and you look, and you just see just, just such a massive bright light. And the verse goes on, said the visible token of the presence of the eternal. Re really picture this in your mind. The visible token of the presence of the eternal. Just, just like Moses in the bush or the pillar of fire and cloud which guided the desert dwellings. In other words, the people who were in the desert. And you, you know how that went. And even in the tabernacle and the temple. Remember where it says that his glory was so thick inside there that they couldn't even walk in. That the power and the glory of God was so thick inside that temple they couldn't even enter in. And it said it even shone around the Redeemer on the mountain of transfiguration. Can you imagine? 
Can you imagine these guys out in this field, and all of a sudden this massive, bright, illuminating light just comes around, just comes around them, and they're just sitting there looking and looking and just being so surprised. And even in verse 10, going on, so you can kind of understand why they were afraid. And it says, Then the angel, of the, and the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Can you imagine that angel? You're sitting, you're standing there, or maybe sitting, and all of a sudden you look, and it, there's an angel standing there. You know, many people think of it when an angel appeared in the Bible that they just, just they, they could hear something and nothing was there. But it says that the angel was standing there. It said he was standing there. The angel stood there. And here in verse 10 it says, The angel said unto them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, to everybody. It come to everybody. For there is born to you this day. Listen, now we just talked about how, how the shepherds were hated so much. And, and they were. Go, go and look and study this. And the, this. They were hated so much. And then all of a sudden this angel says, For there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior. Think about that just a second. Someone who's hated, despised, probably hurting, hungry. People pick fun or bully or whatever the case may be. And then all of a sudden an angel standing there illuminating all of this radiant glow going on and said to you today in the city of David, a Savior is born who is Christ the Lord. Christ is Messiah. The Savior. He is the Savior. Can you imagine standing there and, 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 and seeing this happening? I mean, there's just radiant beauty going on. And then all of a sudden, he says all these things, and he tells him, said, this will be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes laying in a manger. Could you imagine these guys being lowly in heart, out there just trying to make a living? You know, maybe one day hoping and wishing that things would change in life, and they were despised and hated. People didn't even want them. They weren't even wanted by the people around them. Probably couldn't even go into the city without being kicked or thrown a rock at. Or somebody cursing them or, or just picking at them or, or calling them different names. You ever wonder why God picked a shepherd? Why did he pick a shepherd? The lowest person on the totem pole in the world is the one he picked. There were priests out there in this particular time, and you know this, that could probably quote Isaiah from one end to the other. Or some of the old patriarch scriptures that were in the, in the roll-up scrolls that they had. Some of the most guys in there that in, in, in the church probably had more wisdom than, than these shepherds. They probably, probably could, could write their name, and the shepherds probably couldn't even, didn't even know how to spell anything. Why didn't, a guy go, why didn't God go to them? You ever wonder, why didn't God go to them? Why did he pick these, these little shepherds? You know, and everyone may say, well, he, he, you know, that's what Jesus was. That's, that's the way Jesus was. That's, that's what God wanted. He, he wanted to, to pick the lowest one, and that's true. Do you know that whenever the wise men came and told Herod, said, we're going we're to go find this king. We're fixing to go find this Savior, this Messiah. We're fixing to go find this dude. And then he left, and what did he do? The first thing Herod did, jumped up and wanted to kill every one of them. Because a king had been born and was probably going to take his place. Somebody who was, who was messing with, with you know, his authority, about to come in and take over. And even Jesus said one time, and I love this verse, even Jesus told the people one time, and this is in Mark 2 and 17, he says, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician. But those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He, call, he come to call the hurting, the ones who hurt, the ones who truly want relief, the ones who truly want to be saved. And friends, I'm not just necessarily talking about salvation and going to heaven. 
Salvation means a multitude of things. Salvation isn't just get me out of hell and keep me in heaven. It means a multitude of things. Save you from hardship, pain, hurt, all of these different things. You know, will God take everything away? Will he take away all the suffering and the hurt and pain? No, but he'll make it easier. He'll make it easier in your heart because of the fact you know where it's coming from. Where it's coming from. I told a little girl yesterday, I was sitting and sharing with one of my grandchildren, and they were hurting, and they, and they were kind of telling me some different things, and I told them, I said, baby, I said, go to Jesus. I said, he, he, he can fix it. He can make it better. And she didn't understand, but when she did understand one thing, and that was prayer. Go to him. Talk to him. Tell him what's going on. He can make you feel better. He'll, he'll let you know that everything's going to be okay and he's going to take care of you. And maybe this is what the shepherds needed. Maybe this is what God's intention was, is to go to the lowest person on the planet at the particular time in history to let them know, I can help you. I can make you feel better in here. And if he and if he had went to the great kings and all of those, can you imagine the boasting and, and say, oh, God came to me and told me this and this and this. Listen to me. I'm the one he chose. You know, you come to me and listen to me. But that's not, what it, that's not how it worked. He wanted someone who would take it and put it in their heart and hang on to it with every bit, of the, the, every bit that they had. And what did the angels tell him? He says, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Great joy, which will be to all people. He said, in, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He's come to you. In verse 13 in Luke, it says this, and suddenly, and I like that word in there, suddenly, there was, a, there was with the angels. With the angel, okay? Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest on earth and peace and goodwill toward men. And many people, even in this particular verse, would think, you know, there was an angel standing there and then all of a sudden in the bright clouds and everything, you, you see all these, you know, just, just a great glow. Nobody's seen the angel, but that's not what it said. That is not what it said. It said, and suddenly there was with the angel... What did we just read? And the, in verse 9 it says, An angel of the Lord stood before them. They seen this angel. They seen him. It wasn't just some vision that the angel was standing there. And what did it say? And suddenly there was with the angel. So all of a sudden there was this great multitude. It says of the heavenly host praising God. The word praising, we, we've talked about this before. Well, the word praising means to, to shout with a loud noise. It also can mean singing. So they very well could be singing. They could have been standing up there shouting and just, just a multitude like a massive choir. And it said of the heavenly host praising God. And listen, they were even talking. It says and saying. This multitude was saying. They were speaking Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was, then the angel had gone away from them into heaven, <clears throat> that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. <clears throat> this word multitude means a great number, and even a large number. You remember, over and on, is Matthew 26 and 53. Jesus one time told him, <coughs> excuse me, said, don't you know that I could ask my God or my Father to send me 12 legions of angels to take me, protect me? If you look everything up and do the math, 12 legions of angels would be approximately somewhere around 80,000. 80,000. And you know, if you really look and study that particular verse, he didn't even ask for all of them. He didn't. 
He didn't ask for all of them. He said, don't you know that my God would just send me 12 legions of angels? He didn't even ask for all of them. So could you imagine a multitude, just these angels that came, just came and were rejoicing and singing and just singing and shouting. And these, these, these shepherds were sitting there listening and seeing all of these different things happening in front of them, this massive. And sometimes I even wonder, you know, if they were out there and possibly had their tents and their family maybe set up behind them or somewhere in the general area, did their family see them? If all of a sudden this great massive glow, this radiation of God, and there was this multitude and of this heavenly host up there singing and shouting and praising God because of the birth of the Son, did anybody else hear them? Did anybody else hear them? Did anybody else see them? Did their families, their, their relatives, maybe a nearby person, maybe that, a neighbor, or was it just them? Sometimes I wonder this. You know, did, did who all heard this? If there was 80,000, just picking a number, if there were 80,000 angels singing and shouting at one time, don't you think many people in this world would hear it? But possibly not. Maybe God just wanted just these few men to hear it. Just these few people to see and hear what he had to say. And even there's one other place in the Bible that's even said that when one person repents, that when one person repents, that the angels in heaven rejoice. One person, just one person, the angels in heaven rejoice. Could you imagine that one particular day, whenever Jesus is born, all of these events begin taking place. And in verse 16, it says, and they came. They came with haste. This, main, this word haste means in speed, an urge to go and an urge to, to, to go on and do what needs to be done. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. So it kind of gives you the impression that they were the only ones that seen it. The only ones that heard said so they made widely known the sayings which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which they told them by the shepherd that were told to them by the shepherds. So see, these guys left. These guys went in. They found what the angels had told them. And they began to rejoice and shout. And what did they do? They left and they went and told people. They went and told people what was told to them, what they seen. So the news began to spread. Do you think they went to the politicians or the preachers or the deacons or the elders of the church and all these type of people? No, they went to the ones who were hurting. The ones who wanted him. The ones who needed help. The ones who were probably down in poverty or hungry or sick or broken are all these different things. That's who they went to. That's who they went to to tell all of these different people. In Jeremiah 29 and 13 it says, And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And these guys wanted to know. They truly wanted to know who this child was. And not only that, but it made me think. You know, they kind of understood what the Great Commission meant. Go ye therefore into all the world. Go to all the world. Tell him. Tell the world about who he is. And what did they do? It says that they went out and they'd done this. <clears throat> Even about this child. They went out and done this. And the last one in verse 19 says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary kept all of this stuff and in, with inside of her heart. You ever wonder why that one particular verse is in there? You know, why didn't she just jump up and say, yeah, hey, man, you know, nine months ago, there was this angel came to me and told me I was going to have this baby. She didn't do none of that. It says she kept every bit of it in her heart. She pondered and dwelled. 
because I really believe in my, in my own heart, I believe she knew who he was. Because number one, she was told who he was. Maybe she didn't quite understand it, but she knew who he was. And you know, maybe there was a great part of me too that makes me wonder if one reason she didn't say anything to these people, just like today, you have to believe on your own. Nobody can put it in you. I can stand here and preach until I'm run smooth out of breath, but I cannot make you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't. And it's the same way with her. They had to believe on their own, so she kept it in her heart so that possibly they could understand and see that it was real. And it says they pondered them in her heart, and it says, Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. So they returned, they went and rejoiced in praising God. They went out and even shared it with other people. And then they went back home and possibly shared it with their relatives, family, friends, neighbors, and different people that were around. But you know, we celebrate this time of the year for his birth. And we do. You know, we'll, we'll never change it. You know, I, I know you just heard me say that, you know, he, he, he wasn't born on December 25th. It's just believed that he's somewhere around April or so. But this is the time of the year that we do set aside the celebration of Jesus and his birth. But how many people in this world truly celebrate his birth? Do we truly celebrate his birth or do we go out and spend thousands of dollars to, to buy all these children gifts and toys and, and, and all these little trinkets and things and put up all these little lights and decorations and all this type of stuff and tell me what does that have to do with my Lord Jesus Christ? I know it's a hard pill to swallow. But how many people in this world in the morning when they get up and they have crowds of children will sit their children down and sit and read the scriptures of when the birth of Christ was born. How many people will sit down and pray with their children thanking God for the Savior of the world? Or will they jump up and go to slinging toys and presents and wrapping paper and bows and ribbons and all these things go flying through the air and never even one time bring up our Lord Jesus Christ? How many people will do those things? Do we celebrate Christmas, or do we celebrate Christ? Which one is it? But one thing about it, one thing about it, <clears throat> and I do, I, I'm, I'm glad to celebrate the birth of my Christ. I am. I'm not ashamed to say that when we get together, we do read the scriptures, and we pray, and we do thank God. Actually, we did this last night. And that's what we do. And we actually looked on the piece of paper. Our oldest daughter did. <clears throat> and we started doing this and we wrote it down. And she put it in a little book form when I asked her to put it together. And she dated that thing. And it's dated 2007. We've been doing it now for 10 years. Every Christmas. And you know it touches my heart. <clears throat> I know that many times that whenever we do it <clears throat> and it's sad to say it lasts about 15 minutes and then it's over you know but we do it we plant a seed but this is the point I'm getting at we celebrate his birth <clears throat> and you know in a few months there will be another holiday come around And you know, the sad part of it is, it's the same way. The same way. We give trinkets. We give toys. We give gifts. Beautiful color. And all this type of stuff. And never celebrate his resurrection. This baby was born to die. That was his purpose in life. Our God the Father sent him down here to this world to be born, yes, of a virgin. 
for the purity of his blood and the purity of who he was and who he is. But he was sent here to die on a cross. He went to the cross for us, and he died on that cross. He shed his blood, and he was beaten for us. And his father rose him on the third day so that we can see that we can have eternal life, so that God could show his power through his son. That's the reason for the birth of Christ. It's not just him being born, friends. It's about him being born to die for us. That's why he was born. That's the Christmas story. It's not just a baby. It's the Savior is who he is. The Savior. When that angel came, they didn't say, hey, go find that little baby over yonder that's crying, that's laying off over in that feeding trough, and go look at him. What did he say? Today, in the city of David, a Savior is born. A Savior is born, which is Christ the Lord. That's what the angels told the shepherds. That's what they told them. And that Savior is the one who went to the cross and died for us. Yes, we do need to celebrate his birth and praise God that he sent him. But we need to also focus on the fact of why he was born. And that's what we need to tell the people. Why he was born. That's why he was born. And we need to do like the shepherds did. Leave praising God for who he is. And what he did. And that's what it's all about. To me, that is the reason we celebrate Christmas. It is. And it's so great to know that we do have a Savior that came to this world. And you know, I'm going I'm to close with this one thing. And I, I mentioned this one time before. Just kind of touched on it a little bit. <clears throat> In the Bible, there's seven festivals that God told us to do. In the Old Testament, it is. In the New Testament, there's no festivals. Jesus never told us to celebrate anything. Do you know that? Except for one thing. One thing he told us to do. He said, when you do this, remember me. And that's the Lord's Supper. He said, do this. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. That's what he said. He never said, go remember me being born. Remember what I told you last week?